And uh, we're going to start with uh, Jim Dieter from CBRE, who's going to talk a little bit about national trends, and then we're going to bring it down regionally. Uh, yes, I'm Jim Dieter, CB Richard Ellis. I run the industrial operation for the company throughout, uh, throughout all the Americas. Um, I'll tell you a quick, a quick little 30-second. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a, a, a presentation speech, something similar to this, oh, about three weeks ago uh, in, in Reno. To, a, uh, to an energy, energy organization, and, um, and, I, um, and I asked everybody, I said, you know, would you please, as I'm speaking, put away your blackberries? And, and, then, I, and then I proceeded with my presentation, and usually I'm not up on a stage, I'm down there and I'm walking through the audience and not more than two minutes after I asked everybody to put away their blackberries during my 45-minute, one-hour presentation that I was doing, this um, young man, as I'm walking through, sure enough, is on his blackberry. He's going 100 miles an hour, not listening to a word I'm saying. And I look at his name tag, and I remember, I remember his name was John. I remember him like it was yesterday. I says, uh, John. He looks up at me, he says, yes, Mr. Dieter. I says, um, you're on your Blackberry. I says, I just asked. I just pleaded everybody to put away for the next 45 minutes why I talk. And he looks up without missing a beat, and he says, this is a trio. <laughs> <laughs> so trios, Blackberries, pollens, I mean. Um, um, a quick, a quick commentary. Um, um, if we're not careful in this country, we're going to talk ourselves into a recession. We're going to talk ourselves into a recession. The fundamentals of the country is still, still relatively strong. Our exports at a, a, at a historic high. Our, our corporate profits are very impressive. Our, our unemployment rate is one of the lowest and one of the envies of the world. France and Germany, I think, has doubled the unemployment rate. As, as we do. Um, uh, so, so the only thing, in my opinion, I know that there are problems and issues out there, but the main thing is if our national leaders or our leaders who hope to be someday our national leaders tell us enough that the glass is half empty, we will stop buying. In fact, I'll, I'll bet you 10% of us who were planning going into this meeting to go buy a, a new plasma TV or a car have now decided not to. That's what causes a recession, in my, in my opinion. Not that there's not real problems, uh, but we're too strong of a country. Uh, it was so, so refreshing to hear the gentleman, I think his name was Mr. Morgan, about the rents. If there's bad about buying, there's good about rents. If, 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 if prices have, have dropped on, on, on housing, isn't that good news? Houses, how, the cost of housing was so high so many, the masses could not afford to buy a house. Seems to me we ought to be toasting having a bottle of champagne that's finally, I can buy a house, says, says, says the typical uh, uh, American, instead of, instead of, holy cow, my house is dropping in value. That's just my opinion. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> hey, listen, the national industrial marketplace with that said, and it's about, a, it's about a 12 billion square foot industrial market across, across North America. With all of that said, I must say that the national absorption rate is down. It's probably down about 30%. Some of that is probably because consumer spending is starting to get soft. Tell the consumer enough times that times are, are bad. He's not, he, he or she's not going to buy. Th th therefore, therefore, the, the company uh, that makes a certain, certain widget or product starts to slow down. And, and instead, of, instead of leasing that distribution facility in the Lehigh Valley or someplace in the Philadelphia MSA, they don't. They wait it out. So therefore, the national absorption rate of the industrial marketplace is soft, no doubt about it. We, at the same time, the, the vacancy rate nationally, somewhere around nine and a quarter, nine and a half percent. By the way, before we say that the glass is half empty on that, that's good news. That's good news. You want that vacancy rate to be right around eight or nine percent. You don't want it 10 or 11 percent. 
because then oversupply, and that affects the rental rates. You don't want it to be two or three percent. You know, I, you know, I hear people say, "Boy, are, are we are we are we a strong market, Jim, in uh, in 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 L.A.? We only have a two percent vacancy rate." I said, "What are you talking about? That can't be any worse. You don't want a two percent vacancy rate. You want an eight or nine percent. You want a you want a logical uh, a level of supply and demand. In most markets across the country, we have a fair supply and demand equation." going on. Most of you, if not all of you, are from the Philadelphia MSA in the, uh, uh, in, in the north, northeast here. Um, we're going to hear uh, from, from Matrix, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the region here, but, I, but may I suggest to all of you that, that the industrial market is, a, is the ultimate global marketplace. So it's imperative for all of you to, to, to expand your horizons in knowledge and, and in practice beyond Philadelphia MSA because you are being affected by what's happening global. So, so learn about it. Know about it. Know that, that New Jersey is being affected by a, a dramatic slowdown on an industrial absorption because for lots of reasons, but one of it's because of its business environment. So companies now are jumping over into your marketplace, Philadelphia MSA. Know that the Newark, New York port has, has some pressure, even though there is a, a channel deepening going on, and that's important, and that's good news, because the container ships coming from China and Southeast and everything are getting longer and longer. But you better be careful, because there's such a port called Norfolk. That's one of the deepest ports in the country along the East Coast, centralized between South, South and North. That's all over you. Pro-growth. Pro-growth and pro-growth. And they have all the infrastructure. So, so think outside of just this market. You better start thinking about Norfolk. Start thinking about Savannah, one of the top five seaports in America. Some of the other trends, some of the other trends that's going on across the country industrial-wise is that I like to say is that there, there is life beyond the big six. The big six industrial markets in the United States and North America in, in order of size is L.A., Chicago, New Jersey, Toronto, <coughs> Atlanta, and Dallas. Philadelphia MSA is about a 400 million Square foot marketplace ranks about seventh or eighth. Although, although a large percentage of that base in the Philadelphia MSA is not necessarily class A space. By the way, the trend here in the Philadelphia MSA is that the industrial development's going farther out along that Route 8170 corridor, Hagerstown, Chambersburg, Martinsburg, you all know where the, those areas are at going out to Lehigh Valley, of course. Lehigh Valley has been very active. There's about 5 million square feet of industrial space being developed in the Philadelphia MSA. Half of that is in the Lehigh Valley. One of the reasons why that business, why that industrial development is being pushed out is that for years, the industrial developer had to go farther and farther out because he or she could not compete with, with acquiring land or getting the good graces from the local municipalities because of the office developer or the retail developer or the, or the residential developer. Now all the industrial developers are starting to uh, knock on the doors of the residential developers of their land, land holdings and, and see, if they can, see if they can pick up some of that land closer in. Another trend across, across the country, nationally industrial, are infill sites and brownfield sites. The, the, there's, there's certainly a segment of players, industrial developers, that are acquiring the, the classic three, four, five hundred acre land parcels to do mega, mega projects. But also, when there's, there's a little bit instability going on, your infill sites become very popular. You know, where there's that 
was that functionally obsolete building sitting on 10 acres that's only a couple of miles from the port, and you tear it down, you put up a, a you, you, know, you know, grade A institutional, high cube, good dock, dock to square foot ratio building. So infill sites across the country are becoming, becoming uh, more of a trend than the other have. Brown fields, for those of you who have, who have not taken the time or the commitment to, to learn about brownfield sites and what they're all about and the opportunities that they present is starting to be nationally and particularly in this, in this part of the country a very dynamic business. A lot of your brown, remember what I said, the industrial developer being pushed out away from all the action and that's not necessarily good. An industrial developer wants to put that building as close to that port, as close as that interchange as he or she possibly can but they're being driven farther and farther out well, a lot of your brownfield sites are where? Right there. Right there. So that's a national trend uh, that is, um, that's very, very active. Your second and third tier markets across the country have, have, have become very popular. You know, you know, when you talk about logistics and supply chain, and you can't talk industrial without talking, talking global trade, and supply chain and logistics. That's all about speed. He or she that delivers that product from this location to that location faster and more efficient than the competition wins. Now unfortunately for those of you who may have driven in from the suburbs this morning to get to this meeting at 8.15 and maybe earlier to have breakfast found that there was some traffic, wasn't there? I'm just taking a wild guess, okay? Well, if you, were, if you were delivering a product in a 60-foot trailer from where you started to delivering it to this hotel right here, you've got a logistics issue. And that 20-mile ride probably took you 45 minutes or an hour. That same 20-mile ride out on, oh, let's say, uh, uh, 8170 corridor, in Hagerstown or Chambersburg or something along those lines would have been half the time. Speed of delivery, logistics. So the second and third tier marketplaces around the country are, are very, very active today because they're less congested, they're more pro-business, uh, pro uh, uh, more pro-growth, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, they're, and they're really competing uh, uh, against the big, big six. And, and, and I'll close here in a couple of minutes by saying if you want to, and, and remember, and I call, those, I call those emerging markets. So all of you should think beyond Philadelphia MSA and start to learn more about the emerging markets. Not only, I don't have enough time to talk to you about emerging markets all over the world, which I could, and I'm on my way down to St. Louis to give an hour presentation from here, and I will get into global emerging markets. Today I'll just talk about U.S. I named a few, Norfolk, Savannah, Charleston, Jacksonville, Houston, Oakland, Seattle. Those are some emerging markets. If you want to spot an emerging market, just find one of three or four things. Find a market that's on a seaport. Find a market that, that is a rail center or intermodals. Find a market that has high population growth. So a market like Jacksonville, Seaport, population growth. Market like Las Vegas, population growth. So, so, so emerging markets is the trend in, in, in the U.S. industrial marketplace. There are challenges to, to that, and that, is, and, that is, and that is this. If you wanted, if, if, if matrix development wanted to, to enter the Savannah marketplace and you, and you were going to go buy a couple of 300 acres and you wanted to build a five or an 800,000 square foot distribution building in Savannah because that's one of the new emerging markets, one of the new emerging ports and you go to your finance committee, Richard, and you say we need 20 million dollars to close on this 300 acres and build this 800,000 square foot distribution spec building in Savannah because that's an emerging market. Everybody's talking about Savannah as one market. First, first thing your finance committee is going to ask you, 
hey, that's terrific. We're hearing a lot about Savannah. How many 800,000 square foot buildings have been built on spec and leased in Savannah? And your answer would probably be something like zero or one. So emerging markets are dynamic. Emerging markets are, are the place to be. But emerging markets have challenges. Richard, do you want to go ahead and talk about what you're seeing around here now? I can bring it down to the regional level, and I agree with everything that, that Jim has spoken about, which is occurring on a global level, which has a significant impact, obviously, on the region. We tend to be somewhat parochial. If you, if you grow up in this area and you've been doing business in this area for 25 or 30 years, uh, it's a little bit difficult, and you have to go through the rigor, as Jim talked about, of understanding where the global pathways are. But even though we might be in markets that are two hours apart from our, our main office, whether that's Greencastle, Pennsylvania, which is almost on the Maryland border, um, uh, in, um, near Stewart Air Force Base in New York, Orange County, New York, uh, northern Maryland, we need to understand that when a shipper or a retailer or a manufacturer over in the Far East is looking at that corridor, that's the distance that's about a millimeter. And they see that as essentially the same geographic region. And then they, they look to people that are emerging as a, a new type of person in the equation, a logistics consultant, to sort through that. So whereas before, we, we would sit in this market and think that there are si significant geographic differences between and among northern Jersey, central Jersey, south Jersey, uh, Northern Maryland, Allentown, South Central Pennsylvania, um, and even Orange County, New York, uh, that, that difference is being evaluated in an entirely different model. Ten years ago, industrial transactions were handled by brokers. Brokers have now morphed into logistics consultants. Sometimes brokers have logistics consultants on their teams. And what is happening is what used to be gauged just by location, 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 the three L's, is now what we call kind of P3LT. That's a little cumbersome, and I apologize for that, but what that means is what port is it coming in? What's the logistics model that the company is using? What are the labor costs? What are the land costs? And increasingly more important, what are the underlying tax structures in those areas? We have been told that in competitive situations in some of our markets, if we reduced our rent by 50%, it wouldn't make a dent in the logistics model because the labor costs in that market were so significant. So the decision-making process is changing entirely. One of the emerging trends that we see in industrial is that this decision is being made by a logistics consultant, typically not reporting to a COO, but typically reporting to a CFO it turns that model completely around from where it was 10 to 15 years ago. Um, Jim talked about a lot of the other uh, things that he's seeing in terms of trends. Um, Steve talked about removing links in the chain. Uh, if, if you talk to the retailers, the math is pretty simple. It comes over on a 40-foot container, and we put it onto a 53-foot truck. That's a 30% increase in volume. Every step along the way, we're trying to gain similar efficiencies in whatever link in the chain they're trying to attack. I had a retailer tell us once that if he saved one day on average just for his shipments coming from the Far East, that that would mean $100 million to their bottom line. So you can bet that they are attacking every link in the logistics chain. I'll just close with a couple of trends that we're seeing and, um, and unfortunately some trends that we're not seeing, um, differing from state to state. Pennsylvania seems, be, seems to be more willing to attack the infrastructure problem than New Jersey is. New Jersey took it off the table until after the elections. Whether it's called asset monetization or nonprofit refinancing, it doesn't really matter. It's going to be a large chunk of money that is going to be, have to be raised to address the infrastructure challenge. You can see how Governor Rendell attacked it in Pennsylvania. He said, I'm going to monetize the turnpike. The legislature fought back. He said, okay, I'm going to put tolls on, on Route 80. In Pennsylvania, they're engaging the discussion. In New Jersey, we haven't engaged it yet. We have to or we'll lose a competitive edge. Buildings are going green. Steve talked about that. There's a rising interest in exports. 
But again, realize that that's go going off a much lower base than the imports. So the growth in exports will mean increased demand for this region because of the ports that it can access. We're looking at multi-story warehouse. We're trying to figure out how to get regions to go 24 hours. One of the problems that we have is that the movement in warehouse size and the amount of trailer storage that you need to have associated with these buildings because the retailers want to turn inventory so quickly. They become enormous land gobblers, which is why you see a movement towards the I-70 and I-81 corridor because you can assemble large pieces of land. We have the imperfect storm of rising construction costs, higher financing costs, rising cap rates, and flat rents. That is not something you can make up in volume. And I can remember as you're, dri as, you know, you're driving around and you're listening about the subprime crisis. And you know, a year ago I thought, I can't believe they're doing uh, uh, mortgages at, at, uh, at uh, no documentation, no money down. Nobody's buying based on, on purchase price or buying based on, um, on monthly payment. And that's never going to impact the commercial market. Well, as you heard this morning, it's impacting the commercial market. And what it has done in the industrial sector is it has removed a slice of debt that's a probably about 10% of the cost. And what that means is that is either made up by equity out of our pockets or mezzanine financing, all of which is, a, or each of which is a lot more expensive than debt. So our costs are going up, rents are flat, and where demand goes is really dependent upon the consumer. So uh, we're not pessimistic, uh, but at the same time, we are guardedly optimistic. And I think one of the big issues about industrial is going to be how this country addresses the infrastructure challenge. Because if you listen to the people at FedEx, UPS, and all the national retailers, they are deeply concerned about our inability to address this head on and the impact it's going to have on the industrial market. Thank you. Uh, Tim? You want to talk about what you're seeing? You know, just talking about Center City, I think you can sum it up very quickly. It's a very strong market in Center City. Um, it, vacancy rates are at all-time low for about six years, about 9%, depending on who you talk to. If you look at AA space, you know, they're quoting around 10%. But with the deals that are happening in the market, there's going to be no space left. So when the music stops, you might have nowhere to sit if you're a large tenant. Construction costs are going up. I think we talked about that in the residential side. Your TI allowances really aren't going up. Your free rent's going down. So from a landlord perspective, it's a very strong market. Many people were concerned with the building of the new Comcast Tower. What would be the impact of a million two square feet on the market? People were scared to death. It's had a very positive impact with Comcast expanding. I don't think we've really seen that positive impact yet with the amount of people that's going to draw there. Um, and backfilling their space. We've seen a very good job by HRPT backfilling the space of Comcast and the emergence of University City tenants coming this way with Penn, CHOP, and so on, expanding with the tight market over there. They're pushing interest rates. You know, you're around $40 a foot now for a double-A space. Sierra Center is pushing $53 a foot. I mean, it's amazing what, the, what you can do over there. What's going to happen with the market? Who knows? Sierra Center South is proposed with Penn taking about 100,000 square feet. Um, it's going to tighten up. With the full economy that we have going on, full employment, I think with the new mayor coming on, it's going to, it can only help Center City with what the attractiveness is. Um, so where do we go from here? We'll see. The one thing that landlords are looking at right now is credit, especially on second-tier law firms, which, which are very good law firms. They are considering that a lot more. So I think you're going to see some credit issues with different types of firms when it comes into uh, leasing space and it's just going to start tightening up. And Jim, what are you seeing? Um, well, you know, my comments are so specific to the Philadelphia region, mainly from the suburb standpoint, but I don't, I don't think you can have a conversation like this without talking a little bit about demographics and what's happening versus the national, um, national averages. And uh, so if you bear with me for a second, I mean, the, um, our household income is on the rise by 1% to 2% versus the 2.5% in the national average. Our employment growth is flat to 1% versus the national average is, you know, a percent and a half. Um, unemployment is 35 to 5% versus the natural average is in a, in a sort of 4.5% range. 
You know, our, our bachelor degree workforce is high at 15 to 30 percent, and our graduate degree workforce is, is high at 8 to 20 percent. So I think in general, how I would sum up, you know, how we stack up versus national, the national uh, economy is that, you know, we have, you know, we have a well-educated workforce within a moderately growing economy. Um, we're not going to experience these spikes that, that you have in hot markets, but we're probably going to avoid the you know, severe economic downdrafts we also have seen, you know, in, in various hot, hot markets. But uh, so, you know, so with that as a backdrop, I would say in, in the office market, so from a macro pers perspective, we, you know, we have sort of slow, steady uh, rising rents that are mainly due towards because of the um, the um, um, the markets recovering at the top down, which is that you know good large blocks of space are starting to disappear, and so rents are starting to go up from that. We could clearly use some help from sort of corporate America on a demand side of things. The drivers in the uh, in the metropolitan area around here um, remain to be life sciences, financial services, and tech, and some degree technology in that order. Um, you know, in any specific submarket, these drivers could take take up 50 to 60 percent of, of of the demand that's in that market. So, and I think that's a healthy thing. Tim talked about the CBD. Uh, um, you know, it's clearly our our largest market with 50 million square feet and our healthiest at you know somewhere between eight and nine percent vacancy. Um, rents are up at forty dollars a foot again. Um, the, you have to talk about Comcast, and you have to sort of muse a little bit about the 3,000 employees that they've added to Philadelphia's rank, ranks these days, and whether or not that's sustainable when Comcast growth slows down a little bit. It's a question I have right now. But uh, the test, really, for the center city market is, from my, my perspective, is, um, is the, the rent growth sustainable to add additional trophy buildings to our market? Because without that, we're not going to stack up on a national basis. And, you know, the barriers entry in Center City are pretty high and they're expensive, so the rents are going to have to continue to go up. In the western suburbs, which is Balakin, Kinwood, Radner, Radner Conchahawk, and King of Pressure, Malvern, and Exton, you got 26 million square feet that's 11% vacant right now, which is down from 13% a year ago. Um, absorption's been a million to a million and a half square feet for the last couple of years, and it looks like it's sustainable through two, 2008. Rents have, have risen on an overall basis from 24 to $26 a foot. Redevelopment has been the hot thing in the southwestern suburbs, and, you know, we're getting rents of $30 a foot at redevelopment space. Um, there's some new buildings. They're asking $33 a foot. I think there's a question mark right now whether or not we can get that. Um, the test for the western suburbs is really centered around whether or not rents can continue to rise. Um, the barrier, barrier entries on the western suburbs are getting steeper to nothing like Center City, but they are getting steeper, and the question really becomes is can you build a new building um, and be profitable? And we're going to test that market, that, that thesis in 2008. The eastern suburbs, which is Plymouth Meeting, Fort Washington, Horsham, and Bluebell, the healthiest of those markets is clearly Plymouth Meeting. Without the Metroplex building on Chemical Road, that, that market's in the single digits as well. Um, Fort Washington has been the beneficiary of two major highway projects over the last five years, and um, we're seeing the results of that right now. The, the um, slip ramp onto the turnpike at Office Center Drive and the complete overhaul of uh, Route 309 and the Pennsylvania Turnpike has helped that market tremendously. The vacancy rates at 11%, which is half of where it was five years ago. The rents have climbed from 17 to 24 dollars a foot in that period of time. So you can see your dollars at work, and hopefully that'll continue. Bluebell, on the other hand, uh, it, it's, it's an odd market. I mean, it's really anchored by Unisys, and Unisys, as everybody knows, has been in a been scrubbing the market, searching for a new home, and um, that could that could. Put uh, that could put uh, Bluebell in a bad position. The wild, the wild card in the west in the eastern suburbs is really um, is Horsham. Um, it's also the largest in the eastern suburbs of five million square feet. The um, 
it's severe. It, it's sort of has been dealing with some consolidation of, of some of its big users out there right now. GMAC, Read Technologies, and and um, let's see, the third one was uh, GMAC, Read, and Merck also left too. These con they consolidated in various forms. GMAC consolidated into this redevelopment building in the Fort Washington Exo Center. Read into a build a suit of 110,000 square feet in Horsham. And GMAC went, or excuse me, uh, Merck went back into West Point. These consolidations have opened up a big hole in Horsham, 600,000 square feet. So I see the test in that eastern suburbs is really um, whether or not that glass is half full or half empty. You know, uh, Horsham could be a great location for some corporate user that wants to consolidate in a campus environment and can't find a space in the suburbs. So. Uh, over on the Jersey side, um, New Jersey's been steady, slow but steady, and the rents are going up. In the last 10 years, there's been 10 office buildings built in New Jersey, all of which were leased up before the roof was finished. In 2007, we built three 100,000 square foot office buildings. Only one was leased by Lockheed Martin. So the test in Jersey really is to be able to lease those other two buildings up at rents that are sustainable at $27 a foot, which it's kind of the high water mark in New Jersey. So 2008 is going to be interesting over there. From, from industrial, you know, Richard and Jim are really, you know, the experts in that area. But just to sort of bring it into a little more myopic fo focus on around here, um, you know, it's been very robust. There's 350 million square feet within an hour or so of, of Center City. And it, there's a 6% vacancy in that, in that space. Rents have gone up over the last three years. Um, vacancies levels have improved by percent per year over the last three years, and so it's been very healthy. Um, the high watermark on, on rents is, um, you know, in Richard's neck of the woods over in, in 8A area, $5 a foot industrial rents are nice. And then in the western suburbs here, our flex rents are $12 a foot, so they're, they are healthy. The Philadelphia industrial market is really sort of trifurcated in that the, the western suburbs and the eastern suburbs have the preponderance of flex space, which are taken up by a lot of those life science companies. The, the small bay, sort of the low multi-tenant industrial small boxes in Gloucester County, Pure Land and Commodore, Mid-Atlantic Park, and then the high bay distribution space, which Jim and, and Richard talk most about, is goes literally from the 7A, 8A area in Jersey all the way west to central Pennsylvania, which Jim talked about, and all the way down into Hagerstown. And the market seems to continue to be healthy. So, um, In closing, I, I think if you look at, strictly look at the real estate fundamentals in the Philadelphia area, you know, one could be optimistic and take a position that, you know, new construction is happening and rents are rising, and that's great. But... I don't, I don't think you can really look at that without a caution based on the overall economy. Um, I think it was said best by my friend Jim Dieter this morning at breakfast. You know, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, that the um, U.S. economy is the most resilient economy in the world, and we're going to test it the next year. And um, I think how I would interpret that from my perspective is, you know, you you know, we've, we're still a lot, you know, Enron, Asian, Contagion, you know, dot bombs. We, uh, it, but the question really is, is centers around the consumer. And, you know, it's, you heard it from the economist, better, better venue than I have. But, you know, you have this three-headed Cerberus of homes devaluating, choppy credit for everybody. Um, and finally, you know, can we withstand oil prices at $100 a barrel? And really, I think the test for the, for the economy next year is, you know, how much can the consumer tolerate? And um, you know, that's going to be a big question as well. So. Uh, I have one question. Jim talked about how well corporate profits are doing. If we look at profit margins, they're at record highs. But have you guys seen any signs that financing is drying up, that it's, it's tougher to get the financing to build now over, since the, the problems over the past couple of months? It's, it's not tougher to get the financing, it's just that the terms are tougher. There's capital there, but the, the, the restrictions on it 
I mean, and you know, it, it's it's a whiplash phenomenon that 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 quite frankly we didn't expect to have to come up with on average on our deals 10 percent more equity. But it's not a shortage of capital; it's just that the terms are tighter. Well, that plays out in the underwriting of these buildings, right. particularly ones that are on thin margins, like the big boxes that Jim and Richard play with mostly. And I think Jeff Orlean said it pretty well prior to this, which is it's really all about terms um, going forward. You know, we have, we have struggled to buy land in the Philadelphia area to build flex buildings, which is a very healthy product for us the last two years. And the, I think the issue has been that unrealistic expectations for what land's worth, and that's where the building process starts. And if you can't underwrite the land, to, for a reasonable profit, you know, it's a no-go scenario from the beginning. And as Jeff said, it's all about terms going forward. If that loosens up, I think you're going to see, you know, things like Jim says, maybe, there, maybe the glass is half full in some respects. Do we have time for a, a couple of questions from the floor? I've got one uh, regarding uh, uh, the industrial market. Um, in particular, rising gas prices and congestion are likely to uh, negatively impact the, the speed of delivery and the ease of delivery. It would stand to reason that under those circumstances, uh, those markets that, um, that have good rail infrastructure would, um, would prevail and would be more attractive. How does Philadelphia stack up in terms of rail infrastructure relative to some of the other markets that it competes with? You, you know, when we, when we talk rail nationally, we're talking intermodals. And, and, and there's no doubt that, that, the, that the intermodals are, are again, the future in, in regards to industrial development. For lots of reasons, that's one of them. If you follow what's going on with the railroads, uh, the, the Burlington Northerns and the, and, the, and the CSXs and the Norfolk Southerns, they are investing literally billions of dollars in, into their companies, into their infrastructure. Uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, coming out of Norfolk, uh, is, is building what they call the Heartland Corridor. Can I stand up? I, I, I can. I, I just... <laughs> Kansas City Southern, uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I, mean, um, uh, I mean the Norfolk Southern is, is building the Heartland Corridor from, from Norfolk uh, all the way to Columbus. Guess what? Making Columbus a, an, an emerging market, by the way, if you're keeping score. Uh, but, but the railroads and the intermodals are, are, are the future. Kansas City Southern is, is, is are, are, are investing hundreds of millions of dollars on a rail that goes uh, from Kansas City to uh, uh, through Memphis and through Dallas into Mexico into a Mexican Mexico West Coast port called Lazaro Cadenas. And what's going to happen is, is that the trade is going to uh, in, uh, bypass potentially L.A. Long Beach and, and come down to Lazaro Cadenas uh, again, on the west west coast of Mexico, uh, get get offloaded on the container uh, ship, get get put on a rail, and come all the way up through Monterey, Laredo, Dallas to Kansas City, and then distribute to to the Midwest. So your observation of uh, of the railroads is 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 for sure. And, and Gus, with your permission, if I can build off of. Um, what Richard, I, I think it was Richard, said about the infrastructure, you, you know, issues. I just took, I, I just led a delegation of, of our people. I took about 50 to 60 people to Shanghai, and we spent th three days in Shanghai visiting the ports and and the and the business parks, industrial projects, and and everything. And one of the speakers from the um, Chinese government was talking to us, and they, and, and and they said, we will. Upon you submitting us plans to have a building built, we will approve, the, we will review and approve those plans in three weeks. Now think about that, ladies and gentlemen. It's think four about weeks in that. New Jersey. Uh, yeah, it'd be it's three only four weeks in yeah, New it's Jersey. A, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's four weeks for that document to go from here to here. Okay. Now, it's just not in New Jersey. It's, it's a national issue. When we talk, up, talk about infrastructure, so following going to Shanghai, I, 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 go to, I go to Houston, and I visit the Houston port, and the driver is taking me in the morning 
to the port and we're on this highway and we're going three miles an hour, similar to what you all probably did this morning. And we're just creeping along and in front of me and to the side and the back of me are truck trailers delivering commerce, maybe American products to be shipped to the world, heading to the port like me, going five miles an hour at best. So I turn to the driver and I says, is this typical? Yep. Is it typical most of the day? Yep. So, so I finally get to the port and, the, and our host, the port authority, says, says, we are growing at 10% per year annual basis in the Houston port. Our cargo is growing, our, our, um, our, inf our not, not infrastructure, our cargo is growing, our business is growing 10% per year. And I says, that's terrific. I says, it took me an over hour to get here. If, 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 if it took me an hour to get here going five miles an hour and, and, and if I'm driving a truck trailer, and, and what's it going to be like when you 10% increase in business next year and 10%? And I says, is there any plans to be, grow, uh, to be widening this road? He says, absolutely. He says, um, he says uh, the, 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 the city government is looking, looking at this, and they're projecting eight to ten years we're going to have six lanes. Eight to ten years. We're in a global war. Look what a global war America is over commerce and industry. Eight to ten years. And by the way, when I visited Shanghai, and I suggest all of you do, there's a port called Yangshan where the government built a 20-mile bridge. Remember we're talking about congestion? Well, they're not building their port in the inner city and around where you have to wait for a stoplight and a railroad. They saw this island 20 miles out in the ocean that didn't have, well, they had some houses in there. The government said, get out, you know, okay? <laughs> and they built, and they built a, I hope none of them are in here because I was told to really kind of watch myself when I was over there. Um, uh, uh, they, they built a 20-mile bridge in three years. Now think about that. A 20-mile, six-lane bridge so that the trucks can deliver industry and commerce to this port and back. They realize they are in a global economic war. We haven't quite, quite come to that fact okay. yet. Thank you, Jim. I, we're going to have to, unfortunately, wrap it up for the next panel, but thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this Urban Land Institute podcast recording. If you have comments or suggestions about these podcasts, please email steve at professionalpodcasts.com. We produce these programs in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. For the Urban Land Institute, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thanks for being with us and take good care. <laughs>